all, uh, we decide, we continue with the Culture Economics Online Seminar Series, SEOS, which is an initiative of, started as initiative of the blog economist.org and is a part of Association for Culture Economics International, ACHE. Uh, this new season, after a few considerations over how to continue, will be coordinated uh, jointly with uh, Elisabetta Lazaro and myself, uh, more also later. For the initial um, seminar, we welcome Professor Stephen Shepard, who will present uh, joint work with Abigail LeBlanc, winner of the winners of the President's Prize of the last ACHE conference, but I leave the word now to Elisabetta to present all this in detail. I hope you will enjoy. Thanks. Thank you, Andre. Uh, so we are uh, uh, delighted uh, uh, to have here uh, for our uh, first uh, seminar of the new season of CIOS. Uh, Professor uh, Stephen uh, Shepard from William College as, uh, uh, and uh, presenting a paper on uh, women artists uh, together with uh, uh, Abigail Leblanc, uh, who hopefully will uh, be able uh, to join at some stage. Um, so the paper has been uh, recently published in the Journal of Cultural Economics, uh, but uh, today we will have uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, hear from Stephen and hopefully from Abigail live uh, about women's artists today, uh, when is uh, we, uh, we like to recall it, uh, the International Women's Day. So thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for uh, being here for, uh, with us, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think you'll need to enable me to do screen sharing. Yes. Great, I, I, it's now enabled. Um, so you should be able to see the screen, I hope. It is. Yes, yes, thank you. So thanks, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure for me. I'm um, normally I'm on the faculty at Williams College. Uh, at present, I'm on sabbatical and visiting at Gran Sasso Science Institute in L'Aquila, Italy, um, working on some various projects and enjoying a bit of Italian sunshine. Although we, it is a sunny day here today, it is actually, because we're up in the mountains, it's cold. Um, I do want to start out by acknowledging that this project is a, a collaboration with uh, Abigail LeBlanc, um, and it really is a project that grew out of her thesis research. She was very, she was in a course that I taught on, about the art market and acquiring art, um, and that out of that course, and she was also in my, uh, in my uh, price theory course, and out of that, we had engaged in various conversations about the art market. And she approached me about working on this topic. And I was more than keen to collaborate with her on it and, and to serve as her advisor. And then we uh, developed it further beyond the thesis into this research paper. I think there's a great deal that can be usefully learned by careful analysis of artistic, how the values of artistic work are affected by gender, ethnicity, and national origin. In part, this is because of the special nature of art. Art is one of those uh, types of commodities, types of things that are produced by artisanal labor so that each object or small batch of objects is distinct and thereby allowing different stories and interpretations to emerge. But in such a situation, buyers have to rely on signals in addition to the appearance or immediate impact of the work. They need to rely on signals to anticipate the 
value that the work will represent. And those signals are, it's natural that those are going to include characteristics of the artists themselves, uh, which will in turn affect their desire for and willingness to pay for the works. From these variations in price, we can learn a lot, not only about you know, just the operations of the art market, but we can learn about social attitudes towards different creative groups in a society. Um, we can evaluate and understand the extent to which uh, access to participation in the broader social conversation is made available and how the works are likely to be interpreted. So that's a, a major part of the motivation for engaging in this analysis. Um, there's been a lot of concern and interest in this. There have been per some particularly important and interesting um, contributions over the past 25 years. Um, uh, Cohen and Greenwald uh, in separate works draw our attention to factors that limit the supply of artworks produced by women. These include limited access to training in specialized techniques. Um, so Cohen documented the, the fact that the within the art producing community itself, women were particularly upper, underrepresented in those disciplines that require more training or access to more complicated types of equipment. Um, Greenwald stressed the uh, importance of limitations and expectations concerning the role of women in society and how the demands of family and other demands that are placed upon women limit their ability to produce artworks. A large number of papers, including Brown, Cameron et al., Hoffman and Code, Adams et al., have drawn our attention more to the demand side of the market, that women may be, women artists may be held to a higher standard. There may be characteristics of their work that command lower prices or just perceptions of uh, works that are perceived as being by women, even if they're not, are uh, thought to be less valuable. I do want to emphasize that while most of the studies, I think it's fair to say, find that there is a, uh, a, a gender gap in the pricing of artwork so that the works of women, women are not only underrepresented in the market, but also the works produced by women artists tend to sell for less. That, that finding is not universal. And in particular, Bokar et al. find they have a large sample of artists and they find overall that women artists command a slight premium of about 4.4%. Although that varies uh, across the range of artworks. So in the most valuable, uh, amongst the most valuable works, um, the work of women artists is either unrepresented or sells at a discount that's not too far different from the ones that we, that Abby and I have estimated in this paper. Um, so there's, there remains some uncertainty about what the magnitude or even existence of a gender gap in the pricing of artworks might be. And there certainly remains some lack of clarity about what the causes of that might be. So we can start by noting even before this, going back to uh, Nachlin's uh, famous paper in, in the 70s and the work of the Guerrilla Girls, there's been concern for literally, you know, 40 or 50 years about the underrepresentation of women in the art market. Um, this has been widely documented. Um, the goal of our paper is to try to contribute to the understanding by focusing on 
the economics of the market and what exactly is happening. As I said, it, when I was giving a quick thumbnail sketch of the literature, um, one can emphasize supply constraints. So for example, we might imagine if we thought of the supply of art as being perfectly inelastic, there is just a supply of art for from men, but then a reduced supply of art from women, that would explain, for example, the underrepresentation of women, of the work of women artists in the market. There would just be, even though they might constitute half of the people who are interested in producing art, they just, there are some, some factors that constrain their supply so that their, the supply from women is lower. Given a normal demand curve for art, this should be associated with artwork selling at a higher price. On the other hand, if there are constraints in demand, if, if the demand for art by men is different than the demand for art by women, and there's just a fixed supply of artworks by both men and women, then what we might see is a decline in the price, although they may not be, they might still represent half of the total market. In fact, what we see, of course, is both. We see women being significantly underrepresented amongst the uh, artwork sold, and we're going to provide estimates that suggest that those artworks sell at a reduced price. So it's likely to be a combination of these factors, uh, and we're trying to understand exactly how these come to play and, and interact in, in the market. So let's start off just, let me describe how we pull together the data. We start with a group of 1,095 artists. These emphasize artists who are relatively well-known and hence likely to have auction sales. Um, of course, as we all know, many artists have, have successful careers and uh, even gallery representation and never managed to have a work of art sold at auction. Unfortunately, auction data is our main source of information. And so we need to be on, on prices at least. So we need to have artists whose work is selling at auction. We start with 1,095 of them. We collect data on gender, ethnic identity, and birth region, getting all auction sales from 86 to 2010. This gives us 311,678 objects that were offered for sale, of which not quite 224,000 were actually sold. All of our data come from the Ask Art database, which we chose because the images are, are easier for us to get from that database. Um, and we do uh, controls in our analysis for image content and uh, other properties of the images. It's worth making a remark here on uh, when we say collect data on gender and ethnic identity, what do we mean by that? Ideally, what we would like to have, of course, is a response from each artist to a survey question that says, how do you identify male or female or non-binary or other? Um, what ethnicity do you consider yourself, etc.? We don't have that. Not all of our artists are even alive. We rely where possible on uh, self-presentation. So artist CVs that are presented through the galleries that represent them. Um, for living artists, we gave high priority to Wikipedia articles about them because those are subject to being edited. And if artists are unhappy with 
how they're being presented. They could conceivably edit them. <clears throat> and uh, where we, if we didn't have an artist CV or Wiki, Wikipedia article, we relied on uh, biographical information that was presented in art to databases. So it's not perfect, but it's the best that we could do. There, of all of our artists, there were only a couple who identified as non-binary. There were more than that that were mixed gender couples. I mean, Jean-Claude and Christo, for example. So for mixed gender couples that collaborated on, on artworks, they're not included in our analysis, nor are the two artists that were identified as non-binary. Um, so the average price of a work in our data is about 357,000, but that ranges from a low of 3 million up to a high of 179 million, about not quite 8%, 7.6%, of the observations are by women artists, 1.7 by uh, Black artists, almost 12 by Hispanic, and so on. Um, it's worth just starting before we get into the analysis to just look at what is the magnitude of the gender gap. So this lower right hand, I'll be presenting a lot of a bunch of tables and I'll try to and I obviously am not going to talk about every number and every table, but I will draw your attention with some little red squares like this to identify what to focus on. <clears throat> so the basic, uh, the, the gender gap in average price of work sold is about 44%. That compares very closely to the gap that has been estimated by others. Um, notice that the gap in mean price is quite different and typically larger than the gap in median price. So in labor market studies of wage gaps, gender wage gaps, the emphasis is often on median prices because the, the wage distribution is so highly skewed. It's a little unclear which you want to use. So we're recording both here. Um, that gender gap varies a lot across the different ethnic groups. So for the whole sample of artists, it's about 44%. For Black artists, uh, the gender gap in mean price is 77%. So much higher for a much higher gap between Black women artists and Black male artists than there is between white women artists and white male artists. Um, so you can see here <clears throat> the Asian 65% gap, 77% for Blacks, much smaller for Hispanic artists. Indeed, the median, the median price for female Hispanic artists is actually higher than the median price for male. Hispanic artists. So this is not uh, universal. I mean, the gap depends upon the ethnic group that you're looking at. And this is why it's important to adjust for the composition, the ethnicity, the national origin, and other factors when looking, <coughs> when looking at the at, at the uh, price gaps in, in our works. These prices, these gaps that are here, could be influenced by not only the ethnicity of the artists, their national origin, the characteristics of the work that they produce, et cetera. That's why what we do is um, estimate a, a hedonic in which we view the logarithm of the price of the artwork 
as a function of um, as a as a function represented here that is a linear sum of factors related to logarithm of certain characteristics. There are some characteristics that the the data suggests exhibit a logarithmic relationship. This is the set of continuously variable characteristics that exhibit a linear relationship. And then we have a large number of indicator variables that we incorporate into the analysis. This includes everything from year of sale to characteristics of the artwork and so on and so forth. Complete results are reported for all of the models in the, pub, in, in the paper that will be uh, that's in the Journal of Cultural Economics. Um, I won't be presenting all of those here, but just touching on highlights. Um, before I start, uh, I wanna now talk through some of what I think are the highlights of, of our analysis, but this might be a good point if there's anybody who has a question about the data or how we measured things. Let me pause for a second and see. I see a hand up. The beta, I think. Yes. Uh, so uh, perhaps, uh, uh, do you think would uh, would uh, it would help to uh, to? I'm not sure you mentioned that. Uh, um, which historical period uh, are you covering with this data? Uh, which what? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, which which historical period? I mean, uh, 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 the age of uh, the <clears throat> the year of birth of the of the artist being so considered. all of the data. What we did was we started by selecting the artists. Who <clears throat> most of these artists are doing contemporary, modern, and a few impressionists. Um, but it's heavily weighted towards contemporary artists because of the need to extract data from the auction price databases. The actual sales that we have, the earliest are 1986 and the latest are uh, 2020. Thank you. May I also ask one small question? Uh, basically, in the descriptive table, in the descriptive statistics, you showed why the dispersion was so heterogeneity among the groups. Have you controlled for this? We will actually see this later, but have you taken this into account in the regression approach? Yes, we, we use um, artist ethnicity as well as gender as a control in the, in the analysis to help us to isolate the individual effects of both gender and the individual ethnicities. And we also use it as a control. Well, I'll talk about that in just a moment in, in looking at the fixed effects. Okay, thanks, thanks. Sure. Okay. So here, what I'm, what I'm presenting here are the results of four different models. So this is our preferred approach for this analysis is, is just to regress, <laughs> to estimate the parameters of a regression where we can look at how much does the artists being female affect the price of the artwork being sold after adjusting for ethnicity, image characteristics, content of the image, etc. So a model that has only gender and the characteristics of the artwork and circumstances of sale, that's our most basic model and that shows a 16% penalty to the work of women artists is 15%, 16% discount. If we control for ethnic group, 
then that actually makes the discount larger, the estimated discount lar larger at 19%. Now it might be that women are just producing different kinds of work. The, the image characteristics might be different. So here, here we look at, um, we add in variables that measure the entropy is the chromatic complexity of the image measured by literally calculating the image entropy. Um, so when we add in adjustments for entropy, the intensity of colors, and the logarithm of the number of faces in the image, these three variables are measured using uh, AI machine learning techniques. That doesn't change the gender discount very much, but when adding in birth year and national origin, that does change the gender discount to about 15%. So all four of these models show a gender discount, but they show a premium for the ethnic groups relative to white. So <clears throat> artworks by black artists, sell for between 27 and 57% premium. You can, you can think of this final model here on the right-hand column as being the most complete model that we have. There are some that are in the paper that, that consider interaction effects, but they don't change the results very much. So, the word Could I just have something? Yes, absolutely. Please. I'm do. sorry, I got really curious now by your um, uh, mention on the subject. So you have the number of faces in the in the images. Is there another thing that you consider in terms of the the topic or the yes the content so, of the image? You said yeah. So I will. I'll be speaking about that in just a, the the next next couple of slides, but we do, we, we have two approaches for evaluating the content. One is based on keywords that are in the titles of the works. And the other is based on using a neural network analysis that's made available by Google as part of their so-called safe search uh, facility. So for people who are concerned about not having their browser display images that may cause offense or be problematic in some way, Google makes available a neural network and you can submit an image to it and it will give you a response that tells you its estimate of the likelihood that the image contains adult content, racy content, or violent content. And we use those measures along with the um, image, the, the titles of the work. And in, in the final, in this, all of those controls are included. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it might be, I mean, this, you might be interested. Let me just look, show you this, this literally this, slide after this one is about that. So this slide, we can, we can move over it pretty quickly. This is mostly just here to emphasize that the impacts we see from other controls are exactly what you'd expect to see and are pretty typical. The, <clears throat> the area of, the, of, a, of a work has a big impact, so doubling the area increases the, uh, the, the, the price by about 40, somewhere between 38 and 43%. And if the image is dated and signed, or dated or signed on the reverse, that increases the value. Oil paintings are worth more. Uh, paper, works on paper are worth less because of conservation issues, et cetera. So these are pretty much what you would expect. Um, we also control for the circumstances of the sale. So 
By including the logarithm of the lot number, that accounts for the declining price anomaly in auction sales. Um, auction houses, of course, go to a great deal of effort to determine when in the sequence of objects offered for sale, a particular work is offered. And they're keen to build excitement early on in the auction. So the, some of the best works are usually offered amongst the first five or so works out of a 200 work sale or 100 work sale. So in general, prices tend to decline with the lot number. And that shows up very clearly here. Christie, Sotheby's, and Phillips, it, they're very selective in which works they accept on consignment, and so they command a premium. Here we see the estimates for the content. So adult works, works that are judged by Google's neural network to be somewhat likely, quite likely, or highly likely to contain adult content, those works tend to sell at a premium. Works that are judged to be quite highly likely or very likely to, to include violent images, those works tend to sell for a discount. We also do controls for works that have landscape or some, you know, we, we use a number of different languages to translate these landscape, still life, figure, portrait, self-portrait, etc. Um, and these provide additional controls for content. I think these uh, the adult and violent uh, effects are particularly interesting because these are also being used widely, as you know, in the market to screen whether images can be viewed on the internet. So, you know, if, if an artist wants to market her work or a gallery wants to market the work of an artist they represent, they need to be able to present those images on the web. That's one of the ways that they'd like to be able to do it. But if it contains adult content, it'll sell for more at auction but it may get screened out from being shown on their website. So this raises other issues that would be interesting to talk about related to censorship and marketing and gallery representation. Um, so I'm not showing you uh, here the, the estimates of the impact for each year, but we can use the year, the estimated impact of each year to construct a hedonic price index for the art market. So here, um, the red and blue lines are for our uh, basic and most complete models, respectively. So they, you can see that the hedonic uh, index for artwork tends to lie between the S&P 500 and the price of gold. That seems about right to me. This ends in 2020, so it doesn't show the strong recovery that the art market has exhibited over the past uh, over the past year. If we had these for another year, they would show a, a, a sharp increase over 2021. But in general, it's you know the equities market, the S and P 500, has up until the last. Uh, month or so uh, outperformed the art market. Now, this is a particularly interesting. We limit our data from 1986 to 2000, say, estimate the model, and this red line shows the estimated impact for women artists using data only up to 2000. Then we add 2001, 2002, et cetera. So you can think of this graph as showing how a 
art collector would see the impact of different ethnicities or gender evolving over time. You see that in general, the impact of black artists has been, it, it rose quite sharply, quite, you know, it rose noticeably in the first decade of this century. Um, and then has been relatively flat. For Asian artists, it rose uh, for the first 15 or 20 years of our data. Hispanic artists bounced around a bit, but has since been flat or slightly declining. And for women artists, it's been really flat. I mean, it, the, the, the gender gap declined a bit up until about 2007, and then it's been flat, maybe increased a little bit since then, but not a lot of progress. What you would, you know, it would be nice uh, in terms of giving women artists full access to the market if this were not statistically significantly different from zero. That was true in the very beginning of our data, but since then it is below zero. So it's the, the, the gender gap in art prices does seem to be dis disturbingly, perhaps surprisingly stable. It may be that the, it varies a bit with the um, place in the, 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 the quantile of the market, the segment of the market. So this shows the, these are quantile regression estimates. We see that the premium for black artists is pretty stable at all parts of the market. Asian artists uh, decline sharply at the very top of the market. So amongst the most expensive works, Asian artists are not commanding much of a premium. Hispanic artists, it's relatively flat. Women artists, it's pretty flat, although the gender gap is increasing towards the, the most expensive end of the market. So another way to think about how to estimate the effects, up until now, we haven't included fixed effects for individual artists, in part because <clears throat> we wanted to be able to estimate the effect of uh, gender and ethnicity, and those will mostly not change during the course of an artist's career and over several sales. So an alternative way would be to not include gender and ethnicity as explanatory variables, estimate the model with artist fixed effects, and then look at how those fixed effects are, to, are, are related to gender and ethnicity. So that's what we do in this analysis. When we do that, we, we get estimates for gender at least that are relatively close so if we include national origin and other controls in the model, we're getting about a 12% gender gap uh, discount for women artists. Um, the only thing that makes that gender gap really disappear is if we include units sold as an explanatory variable. In general, this confirms our other approach. We're also seeing uh, you know, significant premia for black, white, Hispanic, and Asian artists. May I just stop for a second? Absolutely. Um, those A's and P's are probably significant levels, right? I'm sorry, I missed. I missed uh, those a, 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 B, and C uh, are significant. Those levels, are significant right? levels. So A means significant at the better than uh, sure. one percent level. B is significant at the five percent level. C is significant at the ten percent level. But this means that the effects for gender here are insignificant. Okay, that's correct. So. Okay. You know, I don't want to get too hung up on significance levels, uh, but uh, it is correct to say 
that looking at artists' fixed effects, gender is not significant as an explanatory variable in those fixed effects. You know, this is a much smaller sample. So here we've got 1,067 artists and there's all sorts of things that can, you know, that, that make uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's fixed effect be different from Pablo Picasso's other than her gender. Uh, but yes, it is correct to say that the the gender of the artist is is never it's it's estimated the estimates are noisy and so it's never statistically significant. Thanks. It might be helpful to look at the next slide, which shows the distribution of these fixed effects. So the blue histogram is just the straight on distribution of the individual artist's effect on price. And then the two lines show the, uh, the distribution for women and men artists separately. So the red line is the distribution of fixed effects for women artists. The, the, dark navy line is the distribution of fixed effects for male artists. You can see here that for the bottom, roughly bottom third of this distribution, there's just not much difference between them. So here, the, you know, the distribution of male and female artists is, is not very different. The real difference comes towards the higher end where a lot of mass of the distribution for women is shifted to the middle and the, the men are higher. I mean, this suggests, by the way, in my view, that, uh, that I mean, it's important to remember what we're working, the data we're working with here are based on auction data. So that this is already restricting attention to a group of reasonably successful artists. If we had data from more obscure auction houses and a lot more obscure artists, then we would be adding to the sample at this end of the distribution. And we would be probably not seeing as large of an estimated impact as we're estimating in our hedonic models. Okay, thanks. Maybe this could be interesting to discuss at the end also. Yes, I think it would be very interesting to discuss that. Thanks. Um, let's just, see. So, so now what I wanna do, we, we, we then engage in a number of analyses to try to see maybe what's going on is women artists are just making different sorts of images. They're creating different kinds of artworks. And so we wanna look at that as a possible explanation. So one of the things we do is, well, let's, let's look at whether they're like, women are producing more adult, less adult, more racy, less racy, more violent, less violent images. What we see is uh, women are actually more likely, this is, these are reports of an ordered logit model for adult content, racy content, and violent content as evaluated by the Google Safe Search neural network, women are more likely to be producing adult content images, more likely to be producing racy content images, although the market, the, the, the impact on market value of that, and they're less likely to be producing uh, violent images. I don't want to dwell on it. There's lots of interesting stuff in these models that is worthy of discussion. Differences between Asian artists, Black artists, and Hispanic artists, for instance, in the types of images they're producing, at least as evaluated by the Safe Search algorithm, um, invites all, all sorts of interesting possibilities for exploring and understanding the kinds of works that these artists are producing.
Um, another possible explanation is that there is some kind of a bias against the work of, of women artists being exercised by the premier auction houses. If, if the work of women artists is less likely to be accepted for consignment at Christie's or Sotheby's, that could explain why their prices are lower. But we don't see that. Uh, Christie, you know, within our sample, Christie's, Sotheby's, Phillips, and Bonhams are actually more likely, not less likely, to accept a, a work uh, of, a, of a woman artist. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to sell at a high price. You know, it could be that Christie's accepts the consignment, but then persuades the, uh, the seller to set a very low reserve price. Um, so this doesn't, it's not clear that this is going to cut on prices, but it is interesting to note that the premier auction houses are more likely, not less likely, to accept the work of women artists. And that differs with the ethnicities. Notice that Christie's and Phillips in particular are less likely to accept the work of Black artists. Bonhams, which famously has an extensive uh, couple of sales that feature the work of Black artists, is much more likely. So these kind of, these show us some of the workings of the art market and how those are combining to affect the, the or maybe combining to affect the prices. And finally, we look at whether the features of works that are produced by women are, are doing, are somehow making the works less valuable. So for example, <clears throat> women are less likely to produce works that include landscape in the title, but having landscape in the title diminishes the value anyway, so that would increase the value of their work. Ditto for works with figure, portrait, or composition in the title. All of those women are less likely to produce, but they diminish the value of the work, and so that would increase the value of work by women artists. It's not universally true for still life and self-portraits. Women are less likely to produce such works, but those would, if they were produced, increase the values of the work that's produced. And finally, if we look at the uh, evaluation of the chromatic complexity, the entropy, or the logarithm of faces or area, there we see a mixed bag. Women are more likely to produce work with faces. They produce works with more faces in them, and that increases the value. But adjusting for other factors, women produce works that are have a lower level of entropy and are smaller, and that tends to diminish the value. Now, the works are still selling. The, a, 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 a logia model of do, does the work sell has a positive estimate of the impact of women. So the works are selling, they're more likely to sell, they're accepted at premier auction houses, they just seem to be selling for a lower price. So I'm getting close to my agreed time. Let me just summarize and then let's discuss this and I'm eager to hear your ideas about directions that we can take this research project. So in this paper, we've assembled a reasonably large sample of auction sales and we're using those data to measure the discount or premium associated with the artist's gender, race and region of birth holding other characteristics of the artwork constant. We find that work by women artists is associated with a discount of 15 to 19%. If we use fixed effects as an alternative check on the estimation method, we find that women artists uh, work sells for discounts between 10 and 15%. We find that work by women artists is more likely to be sold through premier 
auction houses. Um, and we, I, I would interpret these uh, findings as being mostly consistent with the hypothesis of uh, demand shifts, of depressed demand for works by women. So whether this is coming because collectors are not aware of the variety of interesting works produced by women artists or have been taught to undervalue them, you know, it's going to take time and education to change that. But I, I think that that's that's my interpretation of this. However, I acknowledge there could be lots of other things going on. What we're working with here is secondary market data. There could be screening at the level of gallery representation that's not visible to us through these data. And I would love to have more data on gallery representation or sales prices from galleries and more, you know, perhaps provocatively, but I think realistically, there could be behavioral factors that affect bidder behavior in auctions. Uh, if bidders are just accustomed to obtaining the work of women at a discount, that may lead to a, to a world where they're starting the bids low, they're less likely to aggressively go after them because they expect to get such works at a discount. And I don't think we can totally dismiss those possibilities as explanations. So let me stop there and let's chat about these results. Excellent. Many thanks and virtual clap, naturally, <laughs> or you. even less virtual. Great. Um, Elisabetta, I propose we open the floor also to questions from the audience, firstly. If should, I... should I leave my yes. slides up or should I close them so we can see each other? Or so maybe, I can see you. Yeah, maybe you can uh, just yeah. unshare them. And if there will be I'll needs... stop the share, but I'm happy to start it up again as, if someone wants to see a table or a number or something. Well, I do have a question. Let me break the ice, uh, Stephen. Uh, um, so it's quite interesting, the result you got about uh, uh, major auction houses uh, um, as uh, outlets uh, for women artists. So uh, I might have a possible interpretation about that. I don't know if you share that with me, uh, saying that uh, uh, women artists might constitute a niche, so a, a sort of market differentiation uh, and uh, toward which uh, uh, more developed uh, with more branches, uh, with more operations, uh, uh, auction houses uh, uh, might be interested in. Uh, so what do you think about that? Yes, so do I understand your, your point correctly that it may be that women artists are out there producing interesting works, but they're simply less likely to offer their works or have their works come up for sale at auction. Uh, rather, uh, women artists might constitute uh, uh, a further segment. Uh, uh, that attracts uh, major auction houses in order to uh, differentiate their market. And even though on average, uh, uh, women artists uh, uh, get a discount, uh, uh, this is an opportunity for major auction houses uh, to, to expand their market. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I cannot, I don't find that, I, I find that not implausible, but with the data that I have, I can't directly test it. Mm -hmm. um, I do have, you know, a few anecdotes. Um, I mean, what, what, what do we know about the supply of women artists? We know that women, at pre so historically, 
uh, training in, in the arts and art production was denied to many women who sought it but were unable to you know, get admitted to art schools or whatever. That's less true in the last 40 years or so. And, and certainly now, if you, uh, the, the number of MFAs that are being graduated in the United States, for instance, is slightly more than half women. Um, if you look at the uh, census data of occupations, it's also slightly more than half of the persons who list visual artist, graphic designer, photographer, basically a, a broad measure of visual arts. So a little more than half of those people are women. Um, so we know that there are women artists out there producing work. Um, and and uh, it's, it's possible that they are being segmented into a different market. I mean, works come to sale at auction not, by, not because of a decision made by the artist typically, but because of a decision made by the previous buyer, a collector who bought the work from a gallery. And now they are seeking to sell the work or they have died and their heirs are selling the work. And so it could be, it could be something that's operating in that decision as well. If, if, the, if the market segmentation idea is to work, we need to understand how they're getting people to divide in that way. Because um, it's not the art, the artists are not the ones deciding to put their work up at auction. But I feel yeah, my question was rather from a, in the, an intermediary in the strategy perspective, uh, rather than uh, by the artists themselves. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a strategy by the, the sellers, like the collectors. The, by, they, the auction uh, houses, uh, by the auction houses. That they, the, the auction houses somehow find it. I mean, there's there are a couple of reasons why they might find it profitable to segment their market in that way. Um, if they, I mean, the, the works do sell if they come up for sale at auction, but uh, maybe they. I mean, I, I think that also that there is a that is in the process of changing. Auction houses want there to be a lot of interest in the events that they curate, right? So they're very, you know, they don't want, they want people to be there and be bidding and, you know, trying to, to acquire the works. Um, I guess, I guess what I'm thinking is this segmentation could be coming from the auction houses but it could be coming also from some decisions that are being made by the collectors who were the initial buyers of the works. Maybe if I just may shortly add, perhaps it could be great also in recent years, there were a few works in the economics of art market using uh, mixture models to segment the market within regressions. Maybe this could help if you would segment based on the, in particular on the women characteristics to test, to verify what uh, Elizabeth I think was pointing to just a safe unit mixture or even other type of mixture models. Yes, <clears throat> it would be, it would be really interesting to have information about any negotiations regarding the setting of the reserve price. Um, 
because that's a that's a critical part of this whole process and uh, you know we can we can make inferences about what the reserve price might have been but we know that we know from talking to people who work in the auction houses that they negotiate over that reserve price with the consigners so and and that could be that could be part of the mechanism that is producing the the segmentation that Elizabeth puts forward and then there's a question of how you know what are the yeah perhaps uh, thoughts for another paper um are there other questions uh, I was hoping somebody would show up and say, well, I've got a whole data set of, from galleries uh, or some, some alternative information. Um, I have one additional question, but I also hope others will also join. Um, could your estimates, your coefficients, so the findings that you have on we, uh, women uh, artists, in any way be put in a causal context could you say that because one would also expect like you mentioned some selection mechanisms at the end and so on could this have an effect on the um, estimates and how yeah. to resolve it uh, i i so the so uh, hedonic estimating hedonic model like this is really not about determining a causal connection as much as it is an exercise in the careful measurement of price. So when we have a complex object, like a work of art, its price is a is difficult to, I mean, we see what the price is for the overall object, what we're doing in this exercise is decomposing that price into different components attributable to different things. So then the question is, well, there are examples of works that were misrepresented by, uh, by gallery owners or collectors as even though they were actually works by women artists, they were represented as if they were the work of a different male artist. So, uh, the, you know, the, and the, there are a, a few examples of this. Is it possible that that could have been a conscious decision made by a gallerist or a collector to try to influence the price. So could changing one of these variables change the price? And if so, would it change it by the amount we're saying? Would it, would it result, could you achieve a 15% increase in the value of your work if you could convince other people in the world that this work was by a man, not by a woman? Indeed, when Abby, when Abigail was defending her thesis, one of my colleagues in, in the, uh, who came to the defense asked her this question, well, why don't most, why don't more women artists just present themselves as if they were males? Why don't they simply say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not Roberta, I'm Robert and uh, or whatever because they could you know there clearly appears to be an incentive for them to do that now you know obviously when people create works they want to receive credit for them they don't want they don't want to be you know they don't want to do that that's not the terms that under which they chose to become an artist but I, I don't want to put forward this as a causal 
um, as, as a causal model. What I would do, what I would hope to do would be to put this forth. I think what I think would be interesting would be to think of this as an input to a causal test of the effectiveness of different educational and diversity policies. So for example, if we collected data over time on the percentage of artworks in, on display in museums that were the works of women and then could relate that to test whether that has a causal impact on the measured discount applied to women artists. So I think this could play a part in a causal evaluation, but in and of itself, it doesn't constitute a causal evaluation. Thank you. There was a small question from Jen Snowball. It would be interesting to know how non-auction sales look. Interesting to know how no. what, Jen? Well, I was just, I mean, I know you don't have the data and, and unfortunately somebody hasn't popped up and said, you know, here's my beautiful data set. But I was wondering whether um, you would expect if you were looking at non-auction data, so let's say you were looking at gallery data or private sales, whether you would expect the same sort of patterns or whether you would say, well, there might be a completely different sort of dynamic operating there. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess I expect, you know, obviously the, the actual number could be different, but I would expect qualitatively similar. So what, one thing we do know is that galleries do, you know, galleries can switch between, you know, some galleries do offer works that are on consignment from collectors and they can switch and do in fact sometimes switch to offering those works at auction versus in the gallery so that that ability to switch between the two venues of sale means that there can't be too radical of a departure in the prices otherwise they'd all move over to wherever the works commanded the higher price. So if galleries, suppose for instance, that a work offered at a gallery by a woman artist never sold at a discount, but if it's offered at auction, it sells for a 15% discount, a la my estimate, then you have to wonder what on earth are the people who can sign the works to the auction house, what are they thinking? They should just go over to the gallery and find a gallery that will accept the work and, and, and offer it for sale. So I, I, that's why I think that they're probably qualitatively similar. However, there could well be departures. And the other thing about galleries is the galleries will you know, they kind of give you an immediate reading and you get other information from the gallery, like how long have you had this work on offer? Um, there isn't this, there isn't the kind of sense of a works being burned the way there is with an auction. Um, so, you know, there, there is additional information available from, from gallery sales if we could get the data. But my guess is that the qualitative impact of these characteristics would be similar. Great, thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, this reminds me um, a study by Marcella Rusinko. Uh, she's an art historian. She's not an economist, but she had uh, uh, quite interesting data on uh, female artists in a former Czechoslovakia. Uh, so during the Soviet era and uh, the purpose of this study, uh, which has been published uh, uh, last year in uh, a book I co-edited, uh, Researching Art Markets, uh, 
past, present, and tools for the future, uh, she uh, used a case study approach. Uh, and uh, the peculiarity of this study is that she studies not, she studied not only women artists, but uh, women artists married uh, to male artists. So if you think about, uh, and I was looking at your data about uh, Hispanic women artists, so I was wondering if there was uh, a Frida Kahlo effect there. Because we know that Frida Kahlo, despite her very much suffering, she to some extent benefited of her uh, career wise, of her uh, relationship with uh, Diego Rivera. But that was not the case, I mean, uh, that was not the case of these uh, uh, Czechoslovakian uh, artists, uh, uh, post war artists. Uh, because and Marcela Rusinko, she developed a market ratio, so taking into account uh, non-auction uh, prices, uh, so direct sales to museums, uh, to collectors, etc. And she found that the disparity between uh, recognition of uh, these uh, female artists and their partners was. Uh, uh, could be even uh, quite large. I mean, uh, and, uh, and and so basically, uh, opposite to initial expectations. So perhaps a socialist uh, uh, country uh, could favor uh, uh, could discriminate less women. That was not the case at all. Uh, she she found. Um, That's really and interesting. She got this data with a lot of uh, by uh, a huge research in uh, uh, repositories, uh, etc. So she built uh, her data set. Uh, uh, so with the direct sales, so primary market. That's a very interesting question, and I'm I'm sorry I don't know this paper. I will hunt it down and read it with enthusiasm. Um, it does, it is reminiscent of, I mean, in Greenwald's book, she um, addresses tangentially this issue, in particular, in looking at the impact of marriage um, and how, you know, women artists, uh, if, you, if you look at their career from prior to marriage and then after they marry, you will see differences in their rate of artistic productivity and that the, those issues. So it did occur to us one thing we could do is go back and augment our data with information, try to get information on the marital status of the artists. Um, and then one might could actually look at some of these uh, issues and per perhaps even look at changes over time so as to tease out some of the causal questions that Andre was, was uh, interested in. But I will look at this, the, the, the sales, the, the, the production of Czech artists, were, were most of those sales happening in galleries or? Uh, well, uh, you have to consider the, the particular historical uh, time. So, I mean, uh, the, the market was not that much developed and especially was not that much developed for uh, women. Uh, so there were other channels. Uh, and uh, as Marcela explains, uh, I mean, uh, there were uh, direct sales from uh, uh, the, the artist studios uh, uh, to uh, public institutions uh, such as museums. There were uh, also private collectors, uh, uh, but that was, uh, was less the case. And it is interesting to, to, to see also the different treatment uh, female artists were uh, reserved uh, in these uh, trades in these uh, transactions with the respect uh, uh, to their uh, uh, male uh, uh, partners. I see, I see. That's fascinating. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. 
maybe I also have additional question, hopefully possibly also others, uh, related to what you were explaining, Stephen, during, during your presentation to this gender insignificant effect, where you showed the distributions of uh, women and men. So if I understand this correctly, basically the effect is significant in the middle and in the top part of the distribution. Have you tested for this? Uh, just, no. I was just wondering, but <clears throat> no, I, I, okay. I haven't. It's a good question. Just no. okay. Good. Yes, yes. It was interesting. Yeah. I'll I'll make it. I'm making a note of it, um, and uh, I'll sure. send you an email and let you know. Sure. Sure. Just distribution thing. But yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Any other questions? Well, let me just say, I, I really have appreciated this. It's been great fun for me. And I really appreciate the different comments. I, I look forward to a time when we can uh, gather again at some Congress or meeting or whatever and have a coffee and talk about these issues at greater length. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen, for being with us. Uh, uh, we were very pleased and honored uh, to resume uh, the, the CEOs uh, with your presentation, uh, with your very interesting paper. And uh, we look forward to the next developments. And let me also announce that in two weeks time, uh, we will have uh, uh, the second uh, uh, CEOs, so stay tuned with the announcement. And of course, we would like to invite everybody uh, uh, who is interested in uh, contributing in presenting uh, at the next uh, at, at one of the next uh, seminars online uh, to please contact uh, uh, either Andre or myself. Uh, so we 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 really look forward to to uh, to to have a further presentations at this uh, online seminar uh, series. Uh, 